In this video, I'm going to give you insights from top scholars on the following question. How AI will reshape the labor markets in the near future? This is my second vlog, and basically I will summarize what I've learned two weeks ago during an international conference called the Applied Machine Learning Days at EPFL. And I will use different points of view. On one side, David Orter, who is a professor at MIT and leader of the MIT task force to on work on the future, trying to understand how, among other things, AI will influence the work structure of tomorrow. On the other side, there is Richard Baldwin, professor at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, who is more pessimistic about the future and how AI will influence our life. He has been defined by the Financial Times as one of the great thinkers in this era of global disruption. We will see different points of views, positive side or optimistic view and pessimistic view, and we will see that actually the debate remains clearly open and try to understand why is it the case at the end of this video. If you haven't done yet, I recommend you to watch my short video on AI, which will define some key terms and explain as well two reasons why AI is everywhere nowadays. Let's go. The AI revolution is completely different to what we experience with the agricultural revolution or industrial revolution, where basically machine technological progress helps to replace back breaking operations or tasks done by humans by machine and improved clearly the lives of the people. Now, AI might substitute some high skills or, or in the service sector or white collar tasks, and this is completely different to what we have seen so far. The first talk of the day was by David Otter, MIT professor of economics. David Otter started with an example, the example of how ATM machine change the structure of the banking industry in the US between the 70s and 2010. Basically, if we look at the big picture, we see that there is a clear growth, an appearance of the ATM machine in the 70s and a growth over time. But at the same time, on the same period, we see that there are more bank tellers. So what happened? What were doing those tellers now that they don't need any more to handle cash as the machine substituted this task or took this task. There is two parts for this answer. The first part is that ATM machine helped to reduce the cost to open a new banking branch. So basically in the US, they reduced the size of the branches, the number of employees, but they increased the number of branches in different cities, different parts of the countries. And overall, this led to a growth of the number of bank tellers and not, as we would expect, a reduction of the tellers. But what were they doing if now they don't need to do this task of cash handling? Well, apparently they started to do more cognitive intensive tasks as solving problems, opening accounts, concealing, and so on. And this led to an increase in productivity of the bank tellers. So David Otter starts with this example and try to extrapolate to see if this will match also how AI will reshape our future. And then, in the context of AI, David Otter suggests three pathways where actually AI might increase the number of jobs. There is, the first example is the Uber effect. Basically, you have an increase of use of taxi or Uber and not standard taxi because technology allows for cheaper, more convenient, more efficient solution. And there is now more people working in this industry and more people using taxi or Uber. The second factor is what we, he calls the Walmart effect. By using AI, it might reduce the cost of simple goods, necessity goods, which allows to consume more of luxury goods or all other type of goods, which might increase the, the demand for jobs in other or specific industries. The third axis is that AI might create specific job in the future, for example, to use those technology. For example, if you're from Lausanne, near the APFL, who offer formation classes in data analysis, 
there is everywhere advertisement for a job in data science or data analysts. So basically, people working with machine learning or partly with machine learning. So nothing to worry about, right? Well, even David Otter, who seems quite optimistic about the future, raised several worrying points. He presented three axes that might be a bit more worrying. First, there is no evidence that this, this increase in productivity really reach the worker in the sense that it, they might be more productive, but the median wage might remain stable. And that's exactly what we observe in the last decades in the US. The productivity of the workers increased significantly, but the median wage remained constant. There is also another worry, which will be that machine might get more and more efficient and less costly compared to human labor. So there will be more investment in machine compared to human labor. And last but not least, this raising requirement for skills to use those tools might increase the polarization, increase the differences between those who can have access to those tools, those new skills, and the others who might remain even further behind than today. Now, let's see together the dark side of the debate. Basically, this a summary of the talk by Richard Baldwin, who started by saying that he disagreed with everything that was said so far uh, during this conference. The tone was set. Basically, he argues that we are doing some inference, we are trying to predict the future using the past, using past technological progress. And this is clearly misleading because AI progress, AI breakthrough, is completely different to other technological progress we experienced so far. And actually, I will get back to this point at the very end of the video. Richard Baldwin used mainly four arguments. First, he argues that compared to other technological progress, AI will replace high skills uh, task or service task done by, by human, and this is completely different to what we experienced so far historically. It will might help to do medical diagnosis or to do insurance claim and so on and so on. The second point that's completely different, that makes AI completely different to what we have experienced so far, is that it has different physics. Meaning that during the agricultural or industrial revolution, you required the machine to be on the site to do its job, it takes space and so on and so on. But with AI, it's not the same. It's just computer software, hardware that may be anywhere in the world and that completely change the constraints or the setup, which make it even harder to do some prediction. And mostly he argues that this will help the decentralization. It will be easier to work with people across the globe from developing countries who are coding geniuses, for example, in India, and that's it might influence local jobs more strongly than ever before. He also argues that it will not look like a factory closure, which when the factory closes and it's very clear and people are angry and manage to try to do some change at that time because there is a strong signal, it will be more insidious, more discreet, more progressive. And last but not least, it's coming faster than we think. And this is also linked to Amara's law, what I discussed in the, my previous video on AI, which is that we overestimate technological progress in the short run, but we underestimate technological progress in the short, in the long run. So due to those four points, he argues that we completely fail and misrepresent reality and the future with AI. But actually he ends on a positive note and thinks that AI will make a better society after kind of a darker period. So let me wrap up. Basically, it seems that AI will increase the productivity of the workers, but there is no evidence that this increase in productivity will reach the median worker by increasing its wage or his or her wage. Second, it seems that it might create new jobs by doing some services or some tasks more efficiently or by offering specific tasks used by, for example, data analysts using those technologies. On the other side, it seems that clearly both speakers agreed that it might increase the differences, the polarization between the workers or even on the world scale, which is definitely not something positive. And clearly, the debate remains open. 
And this is partly due to the fact that it's very hard to do statistical inference when you don't know, you don't have much data on similar events. So AI is completely different to what we have seen in the past. So for example, if you want to evaluate or to do some prediction with a policy within a country, you can do some prediction in a region and try to extrapolate to another region of the same country, the two regions being quite similar and maybe on the same uh, time scale. But once you try to compare to another country to do some prediction using those data or those results to do prediction for another country, it's more noisy, it's harder, there is more in uncertainty. And when you try to predict about the future, for example, with AI, and moreover, with the fact that AI is completely different to the previous revolutions, it's very noisy, it's more prone to errors. And we will have to wait a bit more to see the evolution on AI and the labor market. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment below any question or participate to the debate. What do you think that will happen in the near future? Is it really a revolution or is it just due to Amara's law that we, there is too much hype right now and we think that it will completely change the world, but actually it will most certainly not. If you don't want to miss any content, click the subscribe and bell button. Thank you very much for watching.